Hello everyone and welcome in this video sponsored by Corning. We're going to be talking about massive screens in modern cars and the engineering that goes into them. It's a common trend in today's cars. Big displays, multiple displays, touch screens. The auto industry is seeking to make our cars similar to what we're already familiar with in our pockets, our phones. And perhaps because of phones, we want the response, appearance, and feel of car displays to be similar. And there are many legitimate advantages to using these massive displays. They allow for multiple layers of controls, simplifying the interior. They allow for personal customization, smartphone-like interactions, and very importantly, like our phones, the interface can be updated over time, future-proofing the product. But that's not to say they're not without faults. Of course, not everyone prefers controls to be hidden behind a touchscreen. Features like windshield wipers, gear selection, volume adjustment, and climate controls are often left as physical knobs and buttons, allowing for easy use without taking your eyes off the road. There's also the challenge of the readability of the screen. If the sun is shining on your phone, you just hold it at a different angle. But that's not an option while you're driving, so reflection and glare are important. Durability is also a concern. No, it's unlikely you'll drop your car's screen on the ground. However, automotive industry standards mean you'll need to take into consideration the possibility of a passenger or driver impacting the screen during a car crash. Many of these challenges, whether readability related or collision related, are addressed with the glass cover on the display. And as always, everything is more complicated than it seems. To better understand it all, I visited Corning's Sullivan Park campus in New York. Corning is a company specializing in glass, ceramics, and optics for industrial and scientific applications. You may have heard of Corning's Gorilla Glass, the glass which has been used on nearly every iPhone since the very first, and over 8 billion devices since. My tour encompassed everything from the making of the glass, impact testing of glass, optic solutions for minimizing glare, and Corning cold form technology, which allows for flexible glass at room temperature. We'll start off with the head form impact test which tests the overall strength and durability of the glass, and then explain how it's actually able to do this. It's a reality that the interior of where a passenger sits needs to meet certain crash regulations. For displays, the crash requirement is such that a head impact with the screen cannot exceed 80 Gs of acceleration for greater than 3 milliseconds. Exceeding this can cause excessive brain or skull damage. I know, wild, because we're simply talking about car screens here. So, in order to prevent high g-forces, manufacturers have to build a certain amount of flex into the display's support so that the surrounding structure bends in, absorbing the impact and reducing the g-forces. Now, this flexing causes a different problem, because glass doesn't like to bend, so flexing the screen can cause breakage and send glass flying. Most manufacturers want no breakage during this test. In other words, no glass splintering and no glass shattering and spraying away from the screen. I was able to perform the test on auto grade Corning Gorilla Glass, and as you can see the glass remains intact. And performing the same test on a type of glass you might find used in windows, well, you can see the obvious destruction of the glass. So how is it done? Well, there's really three main ways we'll discuss how to improve the strength of glass. Composition, chemical strengthening, and minimizing flaws. First, the composition of the glass is critically important. Soda lime glass is the most common, typically used in windows. It's inexpensive, stable, and can be remelted and reworked easily. It's made up of silica, soda or sodium carbonate, limestone, and alumina. The downside of common soda lime glass is that its network, essentially the makeup of the material, has a lot of sodium and calcium ions, called modifier ions, relative to the number of aluminum ions. In glass, this creates weak ionic bonds in the network. This means the glass is easier to melt, but it also means the glass is weaker. Corning's technical glasses use a more evenly matched number of modifier ions relative to the number of aluminum ions, ensuring the glass network is comprised of strong covalent bonds and with fewer weak ionic bonds. This requires higher temperatures to melt and refine into glass sheets, but results in stronger glass. Corning can test and develop thousands of compositions within a year, seeking out ideal properties. Second, we get to chemical strengthening. This is a process where the glass is submerged in a hot bath of molten salt. At these temperatures, large ions in the salt bath, like potassium, replace smaller ions in the glass, like sodium. 
This ion exchange is happening at the surface of the glass. Because a larger ion is replacing a smaller ion, in other words, putting more stuff in the same space, this puts the glass surface under high compression. This is important because glass is very strong under compression, or squeezing it together, but not as strong under tension, or pulling it apart. So how does that relate to this head impact test? Well, when the 15 pound aluminum head form hits the display at 15 miles per hour, the glass is deformed and bent outward. This places the inner glass under compression, which glass is relatively good at, and the outer layer under tension, which glass is relatively bad at. But because the outer layer is surface treated to put it into high compression, it takes a certain amount of bending just to get it out of compression and into tension. This means it can be bent more without fracturing. Again, you start under compression. As you bend it outward, you eventually, but not immediately, reach a neutral state, and then it starts to go into tension. But the starting point is significantly later because of the compression from chemical strengthening. The result? 15 pounds smashing into the display, and the glass remains intact. The final and third element of glass strength is that a piece of glass is only as strong as its worst flaw. Flaws can form from the handling of the glass, foreign materials, equipment contact, and the display assembly process. The key is to minimize flaws during manufacturing, but also to design the glass to remain strong with the maximum known and acceptable flaw size for manufacturing. Though microscopic in size, about 5 micron deep, flaws are inevitable, so they need to be both minimized and planned for. So now that we understand the strength, what about the look and feel of the glass? Of course, when driving, the sun is something you have to concern yourself with. That's why on older cars or cars with cheap displays, you'll see a hood helping to prevent the sun from reflecting off of the screen's plastic cover. But this looks cheap and plastic screens feel cheap, so glass is used in many modern cars. So how do you manage reflection from the sun? Two technologies are critical here, anti-glare or AG and anti-reflection or AR. Anti-glare is all about readability. This is a subtractive etching process. Essentially what that means is you're changing the surface of the glass by removing a very small amount. It's creating a surface roughness at the nanometer level so that the light hitting the glass reflects out in all directions, rather than directly back to the eyes of the driver. This surface roughing doesn't impact the strength of the glass, because the anti-glare etching is so thin, less than 100 nanometers thick. The largest acceptable manufacturing flaws will be about 5,000 nanometers thick, and since these flaws are so much larger than the surface roughness imperfections, they're ultimately the deciding factor in the glass's strength not the AG treatment. Anti-glare is great because it reduces and blurs the reflections in the glass, making them less distracting for the driver, and it's better for fingerprints versus anti-reflection coatings. However, it does give a bit of a hazy appearance. To summarize, anti-glare doesn't reduce the amount of light reflected by a screen, but it spreads it out in all directions, making it easier to read the displayed information when the sun's hitting the screen. On the other hand, the second technology, anti-reflection, is designed to reduce the amount of light reflected. So let's start with a standard piece of glass. Generic glass will reflect about 4% of the light hitting each surface. A piece of glass has two surfaces, the front and back, so that means 8% of the light hitting it is reflected back. You probably wouldn't guess only 92% of the light makes it through a single piece of glass, but our eyes are pretty bad at interpreting this, so it looks nearly perfectly clear to us, except, you know, when the sun's shining on it then it's pretty apparent a lot of light is actually reflected. So how do we reduce this 8% number so we don't have the sun blinding us from our screen? Well, an anti-reflective coating is actually a multi-layer stack, in total less than about a third of a micron in thickness. Each layer reflects light back. However, by playing with the thickness of each layer, you can cause the reflections from the different layers to interfere with one another. Essentially, light comes in as a wave, and the AR coating produces the opposite wave. So when you add up all of the reflected light waves, the sum is zero, meaning you see nothing reflected back. Multiple layers are used to account for various wavelengths. Of course, in reality, some light is still reflected, about 0.4%, a tenfold improvement over the 4% of standard glass. AR coatings provide a very clean, glossy appearance, and just to interject my own personal preference, these were my favorite from an appearance standpoint. 
The downside of AR coatings is that they make fingerprints very apparent. That smudge of oil from your finger adds an additional layer on top, throwing off all of the fancy math that went into eliminating the reflected light. Another option is to use the combination of AG and AR, giving you a bit of the best of both worlds. Ultimately, it's fairly difficult to define what's best here, because it comes down to personal preference. Corning has an animation showing the differences between bare glass and the three options. I looked at several examples in person, and saw real-world examples of just using anti-glare, just using anti-reflection, and using a combination of AG and AR. Finally, we get to Corning's cold form technology. This is a bit forward-thinking, looking towards the future when curved screens become more common. An example of this application is in the Chinese market's GACA12, in which two displays with a radius in the center are used so that both screens are oriented towards the driver. This all uses a single piece of glass for the cover, which is flexible at room temperature, so it can be easily formed to any shape, so long as the radius isn't too sharp. Typically, the manufacturing process requires shaping the glass while it is still hot. Once it cools, the shape is set, so any imperfections in the shape become apparent, whereas a cold form piece of glass will fit exactly with the shape it's adhering to. Cold form is significantly less energy intensive, not requiring any additional heating to form to the bonded surface, and reducing assembly time. And regarding assembly, you can handle the glass as a flat shape until the very last step, making shipping, packaging, and storage easier. It also means you can apply the optical surface treatments I mentioned earlier to flat glass rather than curved glass, making these treatments more uniformly applied and further simplifying assembly before placing the glass on its curved display. The glass is about 1mm in thickness, though it can be scaled thicker, and thanks to the ion exchange strengthening process we discussed earlier, it's able to handle the tensile stresses that come with bending glass. Overall, it's always incredible to see just how much thought goes into seemingly simple objects in the cars we drive, like the glass for today's modern screens. The trend of glass-covered displays only seems to be growing, much like the size of today's screens. And while there are certainly controls I prefer to have as physical knobs and switches, I do much prefer a nice glass screen over the plastic ones of older models. A huge thank you to Corning for sponsoring this video and providing a fascinating tour through their facility, and thank you all so much for watching. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them below.